detailed response you gave our committee to a letter. I, uh, uh, I seldom get to do that. Uh, I seldom got to do it in the last administration, so uh, <laughs> uh, I do appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to go through quickly some of which is from your response. It's pretty obvious when you have a member of Congress who flies in and out of San Diego every week that uh, I consider what you're doing uh, on the southwest border critical. I've met with Alan Burson and a number of other people who are, are daily uh, in touch with that, and I think it is critical, and I, I certainly would hope that this administration will give you the resources in coordination, uh, obviously, uh, with the Mexican government to, uh, to have a planned Colombia on steroids, because I think otherwise the border violence that's spilling over into San Diego, completely separate from the, the fundamental drug question, uh, is, is going to represent a real threat to the security of America. And, and I think most people who don't live near the border miss that point that drugs are just another name for, for the money that supports crime in a big way, just as alcohol during Prohibition. Uh, it wasn't about the alcohol, it was about the organized crime that ultimately began threatening our, our country. Uh, I would like to, uh, your response on Afghanistan was good, but it wasn't supported by my trip there. I spent eight days over Christmas. Uh, going through those poppy fields in Afghanistan, in western Afghanistan. Uh, now, I didn't go there to see poppies, but you couldn't miss them since uh, uh, I was reported by the commanders on the ground, both British and Americans, that there's no eradication program, there's no program for eradication, and it's only, it's only just happenstance that people are desperate enough that they're growing wheat uh, to feed their families uh, rather than poppies in some cases. I am pleased to say that the invasion that began, or the, uh, the, the, the sequential a group of invasions began on some of the Taliban head, headquarters uh, in that western region are likely to give us the ability to control those areas. But having said that, I was in areas we did control and controlled quite well, and we do nothing about eradication. So I, I hope in your answer you'll tell us the step where you believe we can do something in a country where we do not have the support of the president, the government, uh, or in some cases even uh, regional leaders, it's very clear that Afghanistan has no intention whatsoever of giving up this lucrative sideline that uh, does not seem to corrupt them as much as it corrupts all of Europe and, and of course, has a spillover effect here. Uh, and I will tell you that when I met with the British general on the ground, he was much more concerned about uh, American policy than I think we were. Uh, I'd like to have you answer, though, two additional areas that you did not expect to hear from me. First of all, you mentioned prescription drugs. Uh, it does appear as though the previous administration and administrations going back a very long time have missed bringing to the Congress and to the U.S. attorneys uh, real opportunities to uh, take the abuse of, you mentioned meth, but I certainly would mention Oxycontin and lots of the other drugs of choice uh, that are, in the case of Florida and a number of other uh, areas, uh, there's very easy to find organized uh, operations that appear not to be treated as dangerously, they almost appear to be treated as white collar, and you can rebut that, but that, that does seem to be a lot of what we're seeing, and people are dying from drugs that technically are completely controlled by us from their inception and uh, distribution and so on. And last, one that I, I've never heard from your office before that I have a personal concern for having served uh, in California on the Prison Industry Board, people do not come out of prison sober from a drug standpoint because drugs are so available in our prisons. And I would ask you a rhetorical question. If you cannot have a war on drug availability in federal, state, and county prisons and have it win, then how can we expect to win anywhere else in any other arena where the complete freedom of drugs is by compar comparatively obvious? And that's, that's really, uh, you don't have to comment on all of them, but the last two I'm particularly interested in. I, I just would make one quick comment on Afghanistan that I don't, I don't think anybody feels comfortable seeing American soldiers or the ISAF forces there among the poppy fields. I clearly understand and Ambassador Holbrook has taken great pains to explain to me uh, uh, the rationale and the reasons. Uh, I think we will make 
progress in the, in the future on that issue. I'm particularly heartened by the work we're doing with the Russian uh, uh, FSKN, their mm -hmm. federal drug control. Um, because it affects Russia far more deeply than it affects us, and, and I think your, your point is excellent. On the prescription drug issue, I don't think it really has been raised to the attention because we oftentimes think about uh, prescription drugs as being safe, and yet young people we know abuse these prescription drugs for exactly that reason, because they believe that they are safe, when in fact, when they're misused, they are quite deadly and quite addictive. Uh, and we know, And we know a lot of those stories. We are bringing this to the attention every day to people in, in every possible way, including the uh, media campaign, which has been very effective at educating adults uh, about what is within their own medicine cabinets. Uh, I know Congress is working hard on take-back programs, Congressman Stupik, Con Congressman uh, uh, Inslee, uh, on how to get rid of these drugs that are existing in medicine cabinets uh, in a safe way that does not harm the environment, and we support those efforts uh, uh, very much. On the prisoners, I think you are uh, exactly right. As uh, state budgets uh, uh, decrease and more people are released, if these people went into prison with a drug problem and they did not get treatment within the walls, we should not be surprised when they are released back uh, into, into our communities uh, that they're going to reoffend. That's why I'm very I, I, I don't want to, my time has expired, but I just want to make sure I directed directed the question it was about the fact that they are on drugs they have availability of drugs in prison it, it's the absence of the ability to have them simply withdraw for a period of two five or ten years while they're in prison i agree that we need treatment but it was actually that can we make prisons a drug-free environment and i think uh, among the uh, the correctional uh, uh experts that i have talked to that whether it's cell phones whether it's drugs within prison whether it's uh uh, homemade alcohol, those are, are, are significant problems. I, uh, I think there's some technology that the prison systems are exploring to actually do a better job of, of doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Kurlikowski, at the UN Commission on Narcotics Drug Summit, you stated that, quote, the U.S. supports many specific interventions, such as medically assisted drug treatment, syringe exchange programs and the use of detoxification and treatment services tailored to the needs of those suffering from the disease of addiction. However, you stated that, quote, we do not use the phrase harm reduction to describe our policies because we believe it creates unnecessary confusion and is too often misused to further policies and ideologies which promote drug use, unquote. Your testimony submitted to this subcommittee while briefly acknowledging the spread of HIV from drug use is silent on both syringe exchange programs that have shown positive results in limiting the spread of HIV and the issue of harm reduction interventions generally. Do you acknowledge that whatever title or characterization you choose to use, that these interventions can be effective in reducing the spread of death and disease? Do you agree? that we need to fund more programs that help reduce death and disease. Does the budget propose to fund any intervention programs that have demonstrated positive results in reducing drug overdose deaths? Do you have any plan for dealing with the overdose crisis and the HIV AIDS epidemic? And what is the basis for your belief that the term harm reduction implies promotion of drug use. What about HIV, Director? Your question about the, about the overdoses and reducing that, I think that uh, a part of the answer was educating parents and doing all of the work. That is the spike in, in treatment admissions. That is the spike in people going to emergency rooms. And it's also causing the spike of, of fatal overdoses. We don't use the term harm reduction because it is somewhat in the eye of the beholder or the ear of the beholder, I guess. What's in your ear and your eye with respect to that? I've heard people talk about harm reduction as if it's legalization, and I've heard people talk about Is that it. how you believe? Is that your interpretation? I, I, think, I think when we go down, no, I, you know, personally, I don't have an No, you're the director. I, how do no, you I haven't it? spent a lot of time thinking about whether, uh, whether I should put a definition on it. Frankly, I don't think that's You, you haven't really given any thought at all? 
Uh, frankly, I haven't given much thought right. as to what I should define it as because I don't think I get to tell the world that that uh, that does, position. But does that have any bearing on the way that you look but at managing? I will. The I'm sorry. Does that have any bearing on the way that you look at uh, syrin syringe exchanges, for example? The term the harm reduction doesn't have any bearing. But here's the way I look at the syringe reduction or, or the syringe exchange programs. Whether I was in Seattle where they existed or whether when I was the police chief in, uh, in Buffalo where they existed, if they are part of a comprehensive program to get people to, one, have the, the spread of uh, hepatitis C, the spread of HIV, that reduction is important. But if they also serve as a gateway to people who are interested and want treatment and can use treatment, then I think it can be quite effective. What about AIDS? What about HIV? A, 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 um, HIV AIDS. How serious a matter also. is that, and how serious do you take your uh, policies with respect to being able to limit the spread of HIV? Do you see any fit between that as a public health issue and your responsibilities as uh, director? I do, and we work very closely with. Be specific. Uh, with, in your we do because, uh, as you know, that uh, this administration, working with Congress, uh, relieved the the federal ban on uh, on needle exchange. But it's also part of our work with uh, uh, working with HHS uh, to make sure that these other incidents, as a result of uh, of drug abuse and uh, and uh, HIV and uh, the use of injectable drugs, that uh, we look at that very carefully and but work tell on me, that. Tell me, tell me though, what you know, help us out here, help me out to understand uh, specifically with respect to uh, syringe exchange programs. And the connection between those exchanges and limiting the spread of AIDS. What specifically are you doing to um, to create conditions which will limit the spread of AIDS through your programs? What are you doing? Well, the Drug-Free Communities Program, which talks about and helps people prevent drug use from uh, a particular... What is that? Is that, a, is that a needle exchange? Is that syringe exchange? No, we don't. We don't the federal so you, don't, you don't believe in that, right? We're not doing federal funding. But you I don't, you don't I believe in syringe ex exchange? I supported needle exchanges in Buffalo. I supported needle exchanges in Seattle. I think if they're part of a comprehensive drug reduction effort, uh, then they make a lot of sense. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, define for me the, the, your, what you view as your mission or your goal. Is, is, it, is it the broad thing, you know, to we, we all understand to reduce drug use, but is it, and this gets sort of back to, your, I think, my first question in your response. Do you view it as we accomplish reduction in drug use by being the coordinator, the facilitator of other agencies who are doing their job? Define in, in as specific way as you can what, how you view your mission, your goal. Um, at the O N D C P, if I got sure. my acronym right. I, I think that the, the mission is critical when it comes to coordination of, of the... I mean, do you think that's your primary, your primary objective is, because you don't... Sure. Is it, you like the grand coordinator for how we're going to implement our drug policy? In, I, in I never thought as the grand coordinator, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, and I would okay. tell you that why it's important. Uh, in 2003, the British government did away with their so-called drug coordinator. Mm -hmm. In their most recent report from Parliament, they're saying, my gosh, we should bring this back. It was a mistake to have all of these different organizations within a government that's much smaller than the United States, all of these different organizations working on drug policy, drug enforcement, drug treatment, okay. uh, et cetera, without somebody to oversee them and without somebody to coordinate their efforts. We are much stronger when we work together and when they, we break down the silos of communication that exist among treatment, among prevention, okay. and among Good. law enforcement. Okay. Now, now let me go back to a question that, that uh, Ranking Member Issa uh, brought up. Uh, specifically about uh, individuals incarcerated in, in our prisons. Uh, it would seem to me that if we took a tough approach, we said, you know, there will be zero tolerance for, for inmates who, who, who are getting access to drugs while, I mean, I don't know if that means super harsh sentences for uh, correction officers who are assisting in that or, or whatever, but are you willing to say that that should be a goal for you as coordinator of our drug policy, that no inmate will be getting access to drugs, at least in federal prison, um, 
I mean, I think the American people would expect that. Uh, frankly, you know, maybe there are some, some who, who don't understand it, assume that's happening at, right now. So talk to me about that issue. I think it's a, I think it's a great point that the ranking member brought up. I, I think it's, a, it's an excellent point also because uh, uh, what goes on in the prisons clearly will uh, be outside, particularly as inmate populations are reduced for a whole variety of reasons. Working with other components about technology that can help to detect the drugs within the prison walls, uh, the National Institute of Corrections, a number of other organizations have, uh, have worked very hard to do that. It not only is for the safety of the people behind the walls, it's all for, also for the safety of the people that work there. Uh, but I think the other more important part is that if they went into the prison with a, with a drug problem, they should be given access to treatment within those I'm not walls. saying they shouldn't, but I, so, I, I, they, I they should that. not be getting access to, to illegal substances while they're in prison. And taxpayers, I mean, you talk about something they don't like. There's a lot of things they don't like about our government, but that's certainly one of them. Right. Uh, and it seems to me that should be something we, we, we feel. I've been, I've been, back in my days in the State House, our State Senate, uh, represent areas where we had state prisons, been in those prisons. Most of my, 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 most of the folks in there are in there because of a drug problem. And they, the drug problem caused them to do some other crime. And so uh, if we can't get after that, I mean, I think that, uh, as Representative Issa pointed out, it's going to be tough to really get at the overall problem in the country. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Foster. Hi. Um, I guess maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I get, I'm a little bit less pessimistic on getting a rough estimate of the cost effectiveness of offshore supply um, interdiction. I mean, for example, um, when the Taliban were in charge of Afghanistan, they had a, a bunch of, um, of bad features, but one of their merits was, in fact, it, I believe that there was a drop in the, in the production of opium poppies. Is that correct? You're and, right. And it's by more than a factor of two. It was a big effect. It was, a, it was almost a zero. Almost zero. They, okay, they so we have a calibration point. We can see what the effect will be. Presumably, if you wipe out that source of opium poppies, that will trigger an increase in the world price of opium, that will trigger a drop in the demand in the United States, and a um, hopefully measurable drop in the destruction of, of human life in the United States. So we, I believe, have a calibration data sample to know what would happen if we could throw that switch the other way, get rid of all opium poppies in Afghanistan, and what, um, you know, do you, are you familiar with the history of what drug consumption um, of relevant drugs um, happened during the time when the, when the opium poppy supply came and went or disappeared sure. and reappeared? I, I am. Almost no heroin that comes out of Afghanistan comes to the United States at all. Uh, and it has not, whether it's during the height of, of opium production or uh, poppy production and, and, and heroin production in that country or not. Uh, our source of heroin in the United States has been Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, the source for uh, Russia, the source for the UK, the source for Europe quite often is Afghanistan. And that's why we really have to work very closely with international partners to reduce the, uh, 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 the, to stop the flow coming out, to stop the production, to go after the labs, as Ambassador Holbrook has uh, talked about. Now, is, is those there, in fact, a world price for this? Is this like oil, where, you know, we, we import almost no oil from Saudi Arabia, okay, but that doesn't mean that Saudi Arabian production is very crucial to um, the price that we pay for oil. And, and so is there, in fact, a pretty um, you know, liquid world market um, for, for you know, drugs in various states of processing? Unfortunately, there's a, there's a, 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 a pretty interesting piece that uh, the RAND Corporation had done a while back that shows that you can have a, a fairly significant effort in reducing, and their study was on precursor chemicals that were used to manufacture, I believe at that time it was uh, methamphetamine. After that significant reduction, the amount of uh, availability of the, of the drug uh, decreased, the uh, uh, price went up. It didn't take long at all for, unfortunately, for the market and the, uh, and the, and the drug dealers to respond quickly. So when Afghanistan went down in opium production, uh, the area of the Golden Triangle filled that void. Yeah. Now, doesn't that really call into question um, putting any money into getting rid of opium poppies in Afghanistan? I think what it calls into question is, is uh, one or two things. 
people that look at eradication as just a method of reducing uh, the amount of drugs that may go somewhere else and don't see it as a part of rule of law. Uh, uh, Columbia, again, is a good example. Uh, using it for other reasons to increase uh, democratic forces to show the, the fact that government can be effective and work okay. and so, actually so be that more productive. Economically, the trade-off the trade-off has nothing to do with, with reducing the damage of drugs in the United States. Is that, so I, that I if, think, if we were successful at well, wiping out yeah. the opium poppies in Afghanistan, the, effect, the anticipated effect on drug consumption in the U.S. would be very small? It would be very small in Afghanistan because okay. very little of the of the drugs ever come to the United States. Well, about three yeah, percent. But the world price effect could, in principle, make them. But the 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 day, um, during the period when the Taliban suppressed it, was there a noticeable um, rise in the world drug price or not? I and you know I don't know the the price issue. I do know that uh, the people that needed heroin or were addicted to heroin could still get heroin. There might have been a dip, but then when the production in uh, uh, the Golden Triangle increased, it filled the void. And remember, too, there's uh, heroin that's produced out of Mexico. Yep. All right. Thank you. I hope I didn't no, 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 it's weigh in on your optimism there. I no, no, think. no. I was optimistic in getting an estimate of how cost-effective the intervention is, and you've been very encouraging that the, the, cost of, that the effectiveness seems to be near zero, according to what you said, which is a very interesting um, thing from a policy point of view. But there are a lot of other reasons for it. That's okay. right. But those, those should be done for internal reasons on what we want to come out of Afghanistan Correct. and not because we expect it will reduce the amount of human misery in the United States. Um, Correct. Okay. Well, thank you. I yield back. Uh, I want to commend the uh, representative on his line of questioning and the uh, importance of the discussion that you started. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, the subcommittee has, uh, you know, we have literally dozens of questions, but in order to get to the next panel, in order to facilitate the uh, movement of your business and important work today, we'll submit those in writing and ask that you respond in writing. I will to those questions. I appreciate you being here today, and I, um, you have a centrally important position with respect to drug policy for this country and, uh, for that matter, internationally. And so uh, this is the first of many hearings that we'll be having. And because I know I'll see you again, I think that uh, it's fair at this point to uh, okay. thank you to be here, thank you. for being here, and to uh, bid you good day. Thanks for your appearance. Thank We're you. going to uh, move to the second panel. And while, you, while the second panel is getting in place, I'm going to uh, make the introductions. Uh, first is uh, Mr. John Car uh, Carnavale. Is that pronounced right? Mr. Carnavale. Mr. Carnavale is an internationally recognized expert in the field of drug policy. He's president of Carnavale Associates, a public policy firm. He served three administrations, four drug czars, uh, where, and uh, he directed the formulation of the president's national drug control strategy as well as the federal drug control budget. He's recognized the key architect of the performance measures of effectiveness uh, system which ONDCP has used to determine progress towards national goals and objectives. He's credited with directing policy research that shifted the primary focus of the nation's drug control strategy from supply to demand reduction. He received his PhD in economics from the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. Ethan Nadelman is executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, which advocates from drug policies grounded in science, health, and human rights. He received his B.A., J.D., and Ph.D. from Harvard, a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics. Taught politics and public affairs at Princeton, where speaking and writing on drug policy attracted international attention. In 1994, he founded the Lindisman Center, a drug policy institute created with the philanthropic support of the Soros Foundation. In 2000, a growing center merged with another organization to form the Drug Policy Alliance and Drug Pol Policy Alliance Network. Uh, Dr. Vanda uh, Felbub Brown, is that right, is a fellow in foreign uh, policy and in 21st century defense initiative at Brookings, where she focuses on South Asia, the Andean region, Mexico, and Somalia. 
She's an expert in international and internal conflict issues and their management, including counterinsurgency and the interaction between illicit economies and military conflict. She's an adjunct professor in the Security Studies Program, School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Prior to taking up her position at Brookings, she was assistant professor at Georgetown. Frequent commentator in the media, she's authored a forthcoming book, Shooting Up, Counterinsurgency, and the War on Drugs. I look forward to reading that. Professor Peter uh, Reuter, is that right? is testifying in place of Rosalie Pakula, who is uh, ill. Uh, professor Reuter is professor in the School of Public Policy and Department of Criminology at the University of Maryland. Served as editor of the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. Uh, he's founded and directed RAND's Drug Policy Research Center. He's written and co-authored numerous books and articles on criminology, criminal justice, drug policy. He's director of the university's program on the economics of crime and justice policy. Dr. Reuter received his PhD in economics from Yale. Thanks to all the witnesses for being here. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I would ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony. And to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. When you speak, make sure that mic is close so we can hear you. Uh, Dr. Carnavali, let's begin with you. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to submit testimony regarding ONDCP's proposed federal drug control budget for FY 20, 2011. Bring that mic closer, please. Sure. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to point out that ONDCP awarded my company a contract to assist it in developing a performance reporting system for the strategy. I did confer with my contracting officer about potential conflicts of interest related to my testimony today. While I'm restricted from discussing my company's work, I am permitted to discuss all of the matters of interest to this committee. I do want to make it clear that my testimony is entirely my own and was not prepared on behalf of or with the consent of ONDCP. So let me begin, be, be, begin by highlighting what I see as a, in, in the way of a new approach to drug policy under the Obama administration. It appears to me that they want to move more towards a public health model that focuses heavily on reducing our nation's demand for drugs. I assume this means that the new strategy will strongly emphasize demand reduction and that supply reduction will no longer be central to our nation's effort to reduce drug use. With regard to the drug budget, there is one thing, if there is one thing I know, it is this, that no drug policy will succeed unless it has the resources to implement it. My view is supported by the evidence handed to us by the last administration. In looking at past budgets, we find they emphasize funding for supply reduction as a means of reducing the demand for drugs. This emphasis on supply reduction failed to produce results, and our nation's drug policy stalled because of it. For example, there was no change in overall drug use from 2002 to 2008. It was 8 percent. The decline in youth drug use that st started in the mid-1990s abruptly ended in 2004 and now shows signs that it may be increasing. There was no change in the number of individuals who abuse or are addicted to drugs over this period, and there was no shortage of illicit drugs in the market. With regard to the 2011 ONDCP budget, it does present a change in resource priorities whereby treatment and prevention receive the largest percentage increases. While this is good news, I do have some serious concerns and that they are as follows. One, we have a budget like those from the past days that continues to substantially over allocate funds to where research says they are the least effective, interdiction and source country programs. Two, we have a budget that fails to present a consolidated picture of all federal drug control spending. And three, we have a budget that makes me wonder if what is being scored as new prevention resources is correct. With regard to drug scoring issues, I just want to highlight a couple of concerns quickly today. First, with regard to the issue of the comprehensive accounting, I've done some analysis and I estimate that if we add back the $6 billion in resources to the budget that's currently missing, we would find that, that only 24 percent of today's total drug budget is for demand reduction and 76 percent is for supply reduction. Second, while the largest increase is proposed for prevention, the increase does little to help us recover from years of cuts. 
adding up the cuts from the previous administration and including last year's $3 million cut to the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program, we find that prevention is in the hole by half a billion dollars. The proposed $200 million increase in prevention in 2011 only partially fills that hole. And third, the request for pre prevention itself, the increase the, uh, for one program, um, the uh, Successful, Safe, and Healthy Students program of $283 million is, is somewhat questionable. My analysis of that program suggests that most of these funds will not be realized as prevention. The new program only says that schools may spend funds to prevent and reduce substance abuse. In reality, this program is about funding non-education strategies to improve school climate and to improve students' health and well-being. If these funds are not realized for prevention, the proposed increase for 2011 essentially vanishes. Uh, there are two other matters I'd like to briefly discuss. Let me start with health care reform. Uh, under health care al reform, along with the new parity laws, coverage for substance abuse treatment services is on the verge of a great expansion. One area to pay close attention to is Medicaid. St this doesn't start until 2014, but starting in 2014, state Medicaid programs will offer care to all state residents. This means that beginning in 2014, Medicaid re resources will help the drug budget become more demand reduction oriented. But health care reform and parity will not benefit everybody.